All right, welcome everybody. I know people are still signing on and joining us. And I will just go through um, some background while those of you are joining us. I am Bonnie Sweenor, the director of the Johns Hopkins Disability Health Research Center. I am a disabled white woman with blonde shoulder length hair. I use she, her pronouns. I am in my office in Baltimore today and respectfully acknowledge and give thanks to the Piscataway tribe, the indigenous people who are traditional owners of this land and of the Chesapeake Bay region. I want to warmly welcome you all to the second installment of the 2023 Disability and Public Health Seminar Series. I'm so very excited to be in conversation with my friend and colleague, Justice Shorter, an expert at the intersection of racial and disability justice, which is what we're going to be talking about today. This seminar series is a joint effort from the Johns Hopkins Disability Health Research Center and the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. The goal of this series is to better connect disability justice to public health by learning from the disability community, from activists, scholars, policymakers, and all around change makers. Stay tuned for some of our upcoming sessions. Next slide. Thanks, Mindy. Um, which will be happening over the next two Thursdays at the same time, 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. Next week, we'll have Yomi Rong, who will be talking about the combined impact of ableism and racism in healthcare. The following week, Thursday, May 11th, we'll have Dennis Newman Griffiths, um, who will be talking about the potential and pitfalls of using AI to advance health for people with disabilities. Part and ASL will be provided at all sessions. Next slide. A few logistics for today. We are first um, gonna have a moderated discussion with Justice Shorter. Um, Justice and I are gonna have a chat. Afterwards, there will be time for audience Q&A. Please use the chat function to ask questions. Your message will be sent to the panelists and will be read aloud on your behalf. We have closed captioning or cart services today. They're provided through Zoom or the link that's being placed in the chat. This seminar is being recorded for awareness. If you are experiencing any, any technical difficulties or having challenges in accessing um, um, CART or, or the seminar today, please contact Mindy at epitts at jhmi.edu. Next slide. And without further ado, I am very excited to be welcoming Justice Shorter to have a conversation with us today. Justice is a skilled organizer and facilitator, a disability justice amplifier, a senior advisor on issues at the intersection of race, disability, gender, climate, and crises. She's a national expert on disability inclusive disaster protections, emergency man management, and humanitarian crises and conflicts. She studied community development in South Africa, peace and post conflict reconciliation in Uganda and Rwanda periodically returned to her childhood community to teach on subjects surrounding social action, communications, and communications. She earned a BA in journalism with minors in justice and peace studies from Marquette University. And while earning her master's in sustainable development, international policy and management, Justice interned within the White House Office of Public Engagement and Intergovernmental Affairs, where she focused on disability outreach efforts, social inclusion policies, and federal agency engagement. Most recently, Justice has served as a disability integration advisor within the US Federal Emergency Management Agency, also known as FEMA, deploying frequently to disaster areas across America and its territories. 
She's the co-creator of a celebrated framework for applying disability justice approaches to disaster and humanitarian assistance, a crisis management method that acknowledges histories of harm, centers intersectionality, and prioritizes leadership by Black, Indigenous, and people of color with disabilities. Justice is frequently sought out for keynote speakers to be a keynote speaker, a facilitator, a performer. Justice's involvement in multiple equity initiatives has allowed her to not only foster inroads with diverse advocates nationwide, but also increase awareness via conferences like this, advocacy campaigns concerning pervasive problems that disproportionately impact minoritized and marginalized individual. She's a steering committee member for the National Human Trafficking and Disability Working Group, where she's been appointed to advise on training and educational outreach efforts. She's the formal National Disaster Protection Advisor for our America's Protection and Advocacy System. Her propensity for leading projects developed alongside people of color with disabilities has made Justice a well-known and effective advisor on disability inclusive equity initiatives. She's highly experienced, clearly, at operationalizing strategic plans, and her work features creatively designed events that center on access, safety, dignity, and belonging. Justice has a steadfast commitment to international development and inclusive humanitarian assistance, and she is constantly participating in emerging projects as an advisor, a trainer, and so much more. That is just a snapshot of some of the things my friend Justice is doing, and I am honored that I have had opportunities to work with Justice over the past few years. Um, and without further ado, welcome, Justice. I'm so glad you're making space uh, to come and be in conversation with us today. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for having me. Good evening. Good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're participating with us today. I can't believe you read that whole thing. I'm very <laughs> honored. <laughs> And I tell people, you know, you can just take different uh, pieces of it because it is, it is quite extensive, but I, I appreciate you so much and I'm thrilled to be in conversation with you today. Yeah, well, it is um, impressive and the things you have done and are doing are just so important. So really important to take the time and, and just share that with the world. Thank you. I appreciate that. So our audience today comes from all different places and likely includes some who are new to this idea of disability justice, this concept, this movement. Can you start by sharing with our audience how racial justice and disability justice are connected? That's the title of the conversation <laughs> today. So probably a good starting point. Absolutely. First, let me just give folks a quick visual description. I am a Black, blind, lesbian woman. I'm coming to you today from Washington, D.C. I am not on camera at the moment, and that's because I'm using multiple pieces of assistive technology to participate, and I have multiple headphones going in and <laughs> to make sure that I can fully listen not only to you all, um, but also so that I can hear my notes. However, I know for some of you, it's important to be able to match the face with the voice. So please feel free on my website. There's tons of pictures of me. There's also, I think, some random pictures from different events if you um, are on Google, just in case that's a point of access for you. Um, that's important. I hope that you guys will also help to create collective access for one another today. I am a bibliophile, meaning that I am constantly reading. And so a lot of what I say will be uh, recommendations and suggestions and excerpts from things that I've been studying and deeply engrossed in. So if you can help one another by simply throwing those books or those articles into the chat, and if it's something that you know of um, that's relevant or related to our conversation, please feel free to throw those resources into the chat box today help create collective access for one another, which of course is one of those disability justice principles. I hope that you all will rest and relax into today's conversation. I hope you will embrace it as a time for us to reflect and dream because my intention is to let things flow as freely as they can. My purpose is not to uh, show up here in this space and provide definitive answers on all things racial justice and disability justice, um, but I'm rather, I'm hoping to say something that furthers or deepens your own thinking because that's how we um, grow collectively, right? And at an event that I was at recently, Angela Davis uh, noted that uh, Ella Baker said that we are a leaderful 
people, a leader full people, right? And so I believe that all of us can show up in this space um, with things to contribute and things to add to the conversation. Uh, so please feel free to do so in the in the chat. And I look forward to learning from your expertise uh, just as, as much as um, you, you learn and take from me as well. Um, so uh, a, a couple of quick things that I will say in regards to that question. So one, if you're talking about uh, what is disability justice, just as a, a baseline, I would always direct people to Sins Invalid, which is the organization that brought together the three queer women of color who are often uh, heralded as, as the real coin, the, the architects and the articulators of what we now know as disability justice. And I say their names here. I say Patty Byrne, I say Stacey Park Milburn, I say Mia Mingus, and then I also look to people like Leah Lachmi Peeps Nassam Rasinha, Aurora Levins Morales, Lee Roy Moore, um, Eli Clare, all of these people contributed to what we now consider to be disability justice. And it is the recognition that people of color with disabilities have a, a, a whole array of experiences that have resulted from being multi-marginalized, right? Um, and so many of us have been left out of the traditional landscape of disability rights. Um, which has largely or historically focused on issues that were more uh, centered around white experiences or priorities or interests. And disability justice says that we want to pick up where disability rights leaves off in a sense, right? So I always say that disability rights is about dismantling uh, systems of, of structural discrimination, right? So kind of dismantling those systems. And disability justice teaches us how to build, bridge, and dream beyond those systems, right? Um, they have 10 principles of disability justice, and you all can uh, go and, and check them out in earnest, but they, they talk about things like intersectionality and leadership by the most impacted, not just the peripheral inclusion of disability, but centrally understanding the leadership of the most impacted. Come on back to Ella Baker talking about a leaderful people. Um, that they also talk about things like collective access and collective liberation because we can't have these conversations and ignore all of our folks who are in jails and prisons and nursing homes and psychiatric facilities and detention centers, ICE detention centers, juvenile detention centers, so on and so forth, right? So when we talk about disability justice, it must be inclusive of, of folks who are in those places as well. So that's important, right? So I start there because when we talk about people who are, are in those locations and how some of these things disproportionately um, impact people of color that, that enters uh, us into a dialogue around uh, racial justice. There is a book that I read several years ago called Slavery and Disability. Um, and these linkages in terms of race and disability were, were never really made for me coming up in school, right? I'm, I'm really happy for the students who we have here on the line that we can have this discussion because I didn't have that. I was incredibly devoted to like conducting my own research <laughs> because I, 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 I did not have that. Um, but what I what I will say in regards to this question, and Bonnie, we can come back in and just kind of go back and forth around this and just have a more open dialogue. But I will say this, racism is anchored in a disdain of perceived difference, right? It is quite literally the construction that is maintained by false premises around um, perceived differences and, and superiority, right? Um, and that's all based on appearance, appearances and debunked notions around physical and mental attributes, right? So we also know that these same problematic theories that they appear when we consider disability as well, right? When we talk about racial justice, that's a conversation and a commitment to changing structurally violent conditions. And people with disabilities are often uh, having to deal with that, particularly people of color with disabilities um, have to deal with a lot of that. And when I say structural violence, let me define that. So structural violence is the difference between um, a people or a person's uh, potential reality and their actual conditions. I come back to this all the time because so much of what we're dealing with uh, in this country and around this world is structurally violent. So this means that we have the potential to live an entirely different reality, yet and still our actual conditions do not reflect that. We have the tactics, the technology, the techniques, we've seen things work in the past, and yet the actual conditions that we deal with because of how a, a policy is written, because of how a regulation is put in place in terms of um, maybe employment standards or housing standards or uh, carceral conditions, all of these uh, uh, approaches or systems 
Someone has to build that. Someone has to be invested in that. Someone has to write that into existence, right? Someone has to keep that afloat. And the act of doing that, the the reciprocal impacts of that, um, or the residual rather, impacts of that, the ripple effects of that are incredibly harmful and dangerous, and in some cases deadly to people with disabilities. And there is an inherent violence that is present there that I think has to be addressed. So when we're talking about issues at the nexus of racial justice and disability justice, we're also talking about systems and structures that must be fundamentally altered in order to ensure our collective survival. That's a lot. Yeah. Also, yeah. <laughs> lot. Justice, you're, you're, yeah. I mean, so important. You always have such important <laughs> perspective to share and I'm just so grateful to you for this. I mean, I, yeah, I'm almost speechless of, of, of what to say after that. You know, I think what you said and sort of this discussion point around, you know, how we're hi putting hierarchy to human life, right? Mm -hmm. you know, there's so much in coming at this from um, a space of public health. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't always think we think about our work that way is mm -hmm. what are we doing to uphold or dismantle those structures that put a hierarchy to human life and the mm -hmm. forces that do that, right? And I think things we're doing all day, every day are either eroding that or holding it up or sometimes making it worse. And um, it's just so important, I think, for people to, to have these conversations and learn about this to have a better grip on on their role in this, this whole system, you know, the system that either keeps these things um, in oppression or can help to get to liberation as you're describing. And right. it's so, I mean, I'm just really grateful and that's why I always love talking to you. No, oh, this is a, it's a good conversation. If, if, if it's okay, I will add to that. I, I think, yeah, please. Um, you, you definitely sparked a couple of things. I've just been jotting down notes as you've been talking because this, uh, I'll be honest with you, and I, I'm, I'm going to share a, a lot of my heart because I don't know how to do this any other way. I, I did a session a couple of months ago, and I was almost dissuaded from doing guest lectures moving forward because the students at that time seemed to be very much committed to this idea of scarcity, this idea that there's, this is just the way things are. And again, this is what I mean when I say it's structurally violent. It makes you think that this is just the natural order of things, right? Uh, when we think about weather uh, related disasters, well, this is just an act of God. Uh, can't have anything to do with pollution. Uh, can't have anything to do with carbon emissions. You know, like can't have anything to do with our behaviors. It's just an act of God. These things happen. Nothing that can be done. But this idea of scarcity, even when we were having conversations around the pandemic, and folks were saying, "Well, listen, we just we just have a, a, a lack of resources. There's nothing that can be done. People have small budgets," and that it really it it, it honestly it saddened me because and and if someone can drop this in the chat, I appreciate it. The book Poverty by America by Matthew Desmond. He acknowledges in that book how much money goes unused, how much money that is, we're not even talking about newly allocated funds, right? We're not even talking about the kind of new taxes and things like that. He's like, the, the money that has already been allocated, he, he identifies multiple channels to addressing this pervasive problem of, of, of poverty throughout the country. One of the channels that he talks about, though, um, is this issue of, of what the, the misappropriation of funds that are already there. And that kind of gets, it, it, it always is something that frustrates me to no end because as people with disabilities, particularly people of color with disabilities, there's always this stereotype of, of mooching off the system. You know what I mean? That you're, you're, you're taking away, you're, you're too entitled. And yet there's so much money that goes misappropriated or misused. And I say that, and I want to acknowledge that in an attempt to open up an entryway for uh, students and staff or whoever's on this line right now to kind of remove us from this very constricted box of thinking that scarcity is in place simply because things are scarce, right? <laughs> there's, there's no way to do it. We had a, um, a, a 
particular number, depending on where you were, of ventilators because that was a choice that was made, right? There's a policy decision that is made around how much money would be invested in having a particular number before the pandemic even uh, took place um, of ventilators in, in, in various areas, right? That, that's, a, that's a decision that is made. In terms of what we invest in, those are decisions that are being made, irrespective of what you think, irrespective of what your political designation is. We have to come to an agreement around the fact that people make choices. Politics is all about choices. Legislation is all about choices. There is a, there's a yes, there is a vote up, there's a vote down. Um, and so what are we saying yes to? And what then does that lead us to say no to later on, right? Too often people with disabilities, I'm always gonna come back because my root, my center is people of color with disabilities. Too often we are the ones perpetually told no that there is no other option, that this is just the way that things are. There is no alternative. Do you know how restricting and how limiting it is to live in a world where that is given to you as truth and you have to work within those confines? It is exhausting. Right. And so I always come around to this because, look, let me make another linkage. So we uh, talked about this in terms of scarcity. You can also look at this in terms of sacrifice zones. Right. So we talk about this a lot in environmental justice work. A lot of my work also focuses on environmental justice. And you'll have folks who say, well, these areas that, you know, we have to make some sacrifices here, people. OK, in order to if you, if you want electricity, if you want cars on the road, if you want to have a highway, we're going to have to make some sacrifices got to tighten our belts and pull up our bootstraps don't know why i'm talking in that accent but we gotta we gotta we gotta we gotta do this thing here right? we gotta we gotta tighten it tighten up some stuff here um and that really floors me sometimes because who's being asked to make the sacrifices the sacrifices are not evenly distributed what does that mean that means when you're trying to figure out a highway a lot of times you identify poor or indigenous lands to run through when you are uh, identifying areas for toxic dump sites, you are identifying poor and indigenous lands to do this on or indigenous areas or, or poor, low income, people of color uh, areas to, to do this on. We talk about pipelines, so on and so forth. We talk about land grabs, so on and so forth. Why am I mentioning this? Because there is a public health linkage to all of these issues. And that is important that we not silo or silence ourselves in this way. And thinking that, oh, that's just a, that's, that's not our area. That's not what we're going to concentrate on. We're, we're focused specifically on the health. You can't talk to me about public health and ignore the fact that somebody's grandmother and somebody's daughter and somebody's mother and somebody's father and somebody's uncle have uh, developed all types of respiratory issues as a result of the pollution that is roaming freely in their air. Right. And I, there's no shortage of, 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 of cities that we could talk about. Right. We can talk about cities in West Virginia. We can talk about cities in Louisiana. We can talk about cities in Texas. We can talk about cities in Arkansas. Right. If we want to talk about this issue of environmental racism and how often people of color who already have disabilities um, are disproportionately impacted. And of course, unfortunately, disability is sometimes positioned as the boogeyman. You know, like we should stop these issues because we don't want folks to develop disabilities and we often have to have conversations with environmental comrades about that like you cannot position it that way because it's completely dehumanizing um, to people who already have disabilities right it's disrespectful to people who already have disabilities we want to breathe in clean air because we all deserve the right to breathe in clean air not because your life is no longer worth living if you have a disability right so I just say all of these just as examples to paint pictures to make connections between stories because it serves us no uh, interest. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't support us. It doesn't serve us to think about these issues as separate and to silo these things. So I always try to ground by letting people know no matter where you come to this work, there's a place and a space for you because all of it is connected. Yeah, powerful as always, Justice. Thank you. And you know, what I am taking from that, and I certainly hope everyone in the audience is taking from that, is everything in public health is connected to this, right? Is connected to disability justice, is connected to racial justice. And I think, you know, what you are outlining are illustrating so beautifully is just that, you know, the examples you gave span, you know, many schools of public health, the issues we're studying and recovering and you know, in my experience too often, the view is that example you just gave at the end, right, is either, um, you know, 
that positioning of disability as you know preventing and and you know that very ableist view of, of just dehumanizing as you very well put it view of disability or as you also illustrated that's not my issue to deal with i have nothing to do with that and how do we get people to realize yeah you do every single mm -hmm. one of us does mm -hmm. and it is you know, I think almost a disservice sometimes in public health, we don't have these kinds of conversations with, you know, experts like you who are doing this kind of work and have this understanding that quite frankly has historically been excluded from conversations mm -hmm. of public health, you know, and that's part of it. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, yeah, just the, the the span of public health is is entrenched in these ideas, is built on these ideas, touches these ideas. And so as you indicated, you know, we certainly do have some trainees in the audience. And and so what do you wish that the next generation of public health professionals might know, might learn about, <laughs> about this interconnection that we're talking about that is so important you know, to help change this paradigm a little bit to help you know, move this all forward mm, oh my goodness okay so you should set a timer and stop me at some point <laughs> because I will never stop dreaming you know like I will I will never stop coming up with fun and 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 in and, and some cases what people may perceive is absolutely absurd but so much of what has been accomplished and achieved by people who have been uh invisibilized and othered and discounted has 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 been just that right it has been um miraculous it has been magical it has been something extraordinary that people would have never perceived as possible i i think about um ruth wilson gilmore uh she talks about organized abandonment if somebody wants to throw ruth wilson gilmore into the chat or, or uh, a, a link to um, any of the articles where she's quoted as talking about um organized abandonment because I think about that when we talk about issues of, of sacrifice zones or this, this idea of scarcity, scarcity, I link it to those, those issues because when she talks about it, she's talking about how a community is uh, kind of stripped of, drained of access to things that would ultimately um, support and serve that community, right? So stripped up things like basic, you know, the, the public health supports that they might need, the mental health uh, services that they may need, the social support services that they need. And then the absence of that, there is a greater reliance, um, forced reliance on carceral uh, entities such as prisons and police um, and jails and so on, all of the industries associated with that. And I think about that in terms of uh, uh, organized abandonment. And I think about how often um, our communities have been abandoned in one way, shape or another. And we, there is this expectation that, um, you know, either you'll, you'll, you'll figure it out on your own or, um, you know, too bad to be you. And one of the things that I love about disability justice is that it, it teaches you that even if it's just one, even if it's just one other person, then you have enough that is enough for you to build, that is enough for you to go beyond what we've been given, beyond what we've seen, beyond what we've heard, right? Beyond what we even currently know to be true. And there's something gorgeous about that because we've always had to save our own lives in some way, shape or form, even when those supports are given. I'll, I'll give you basic examples because I want to I want to ground this in a public health context. Even if there is a clinic in your neighborhood, if there is no one available to help you fill out the intake forms, do you think you'll be able to fully share your medical history? If there's no reasonable accommodations present after you have requested it time and time again, do you think you'll be comfortable enough to really provide the information that is necessary uh, for your recovery? Let's say you're in, in some uh, rehabilitation um, uh, uh, supports or, 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 or appointments, right? So these are things to think about, um, right? If you're, if you're having telehealth appointments and it's not accessible, these are all things to think about. Even if you call a clinic, and this happens to me sometimes where their phone systems will boot you off if you don't put the right number in soon enough. And because I'm listening to my phone to put in the number on my cell phone, um, 
I sometimes get booted off these systems and it's terribly frustrating, right? So when I talk about saving our own lives, it makes me think of a book of that title. It's called Saving Our Own Lives, A Liberatory Practice of Harm Reduction. And that's by um, uh, Hassan. Um, it's not, uh, her last name is Hassan. Um, and so I would, I would highly, uh, if someone could throw that in the chat, that would also be appreciated. Um, Samira Hassan, I was going off top of, Mira, of my memory here. Um, also a wonderful book to read because we're talking about harm reduction. Uh, uh, there has been a lot of misconceptions around um, public health and its connections to harm reduction and understanding where the, the, the lineage and the roots of harm reduction um, really started and recognizing that is absolutely critical. So that's, that's something to, to, to think about. Um, I also encourage you all to critique by creating, and that of course comes from Michelangelo. I was listening to um, Miriam Kaba earlier, who of course is the author of a wonderful book, We Do This Till We Free Us, all about abolition. And she mentioned that we critique by creating. And I thought that that was, she mentioned that that was a Michelangelo quote. And I thought that that was gorgeous because that is quite honestly where I ended up landing when I felt so burnt out when I felt as if there was, I, I was tired of being on conversations where people were throwing each other uh, down and you know, metaphorically uh, putting each other down. Um, there was a lot of cattiness and, 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 and things that just sometimes happen when you have a lot of people um, who, who are coming together trying to fight for a social justice issue, or even when you have people who actually work for more formal uh, agencies and, and, and um, uh, entities kind of coming together. A lot of those conversations just were draining. And I said, I'm going to move to a space of creation because that is what allows me to breathe. And that is what is going to sustain me in this way. Um, so I, I would encourage you to think about that. If you really, if you have critiques of the system and if you, if it is your, um, uh, mo to critique it and to, to to try to change it by you know being more direct in that way um and, and complaints and com public commentary and all of that do that do that because there's space for that and for those of you who say i want to create something different i want to be in a space of building and creating and dreaming there's also a space for you in that as well right so let nobody tell you different i just finished re reading the book uh, weathering by Arlene Geronimus. And so she says, and I'm going to read this because I think it's important for me to get this quote right. She said that weathering results from repeated or sustained activation of the physiological stress responses over years and eventually decades. So this means that a person's um, health and life expectancy depends on their experiences and their interactions with others and the physical environment they live in more than their DNA signature or lifestyle. I thought that was huge. Um, I, I believe that that work is incredibly important and I've been quoting uh, Dr. Geronimus for years. Um, however, after reading that book, <laughs> all my heart could say is that this has to be expanded to include the weathering effects of ableism on people of color with disability. Um, because although it often referenced various justice-based movements, it never mentioned uh, an acknowledgement of disability justice or ableism, right? Um, it talked about maternal mortality, but there was no mention of maternal mortality for black women with disabilities or black birthing folks with disabilities, right? Um, they talked about doulas, but I would have loved for there to be a consideration. They talked about doulas as kind of an example or a um, pathway to create greater safety um, for birthing people. And the one thing that I thought of is, my goodness, it would have been great to include the concept of disability doulas, which was coined by Stacey Park Milburn, right? Like as a means of survival, as a means of, of helping and ushering um, and supporting people through their journey of, of, dis of newly acquired disabilities, right? So like all of that is, is, is important to me. <laughs> like all of those are things that I think we need to be, uh, things I think we need to be thinking about in various ways. Um, and I can go on and on and on, but I, no matter what you're doing in terms of this work, I, I highly encourage you to understand where uh, you position yourself as it relates to disability. If it's around education, well, then we need to be having conversations around poor ventilation in schools. An EPA representative uh, was noted as saying it, it was only once the pandemic struck 
that she was able to, to see real movement around getting better ventilation systems in schools because she had been advocating for that for so long. And it wasn't until the pandemic hit that especially in, in kind of low-income areas um, and certain high, areas that were, I guess, quote unquote, deemed high risk, that there was finally an opportunity to, to change that, right? So I think all of those are things that, that we can be talking about and thinking through. Yeah, I mean, a million good points and so powerful. You know, what strikes me, so many things strike me from, from what you just said, but that, that statement about um, critique through creativity or by creating, you know, I, I, I don't think that often as researchers, um, we think of our work as a creative act. And um, it is, you know, there's, there's an enormous amount of, of creativity involved in doing research. And it's maybe it's different than um, how creativity has been historically conceived. But, you know, um, advocacy research and doing research to make change or to advocate for change or to push policy change you know, I think of, I thinking of that, hearing you say that is the role of public health, which is built on structures of social justice. Mm -hmm. And we have, we don't always remember that, I think, right? It's, it's, it become transactional in so many ways in, you know, progress in the methods and um, is important, but also in critiquing, you know, the, the, the systems that are upholding the barriers to that pursuit of social mm -hmm. justice mm -hmm. and is so important. And, you know, your statements around just the erasure of ableism and disability from these spaces and what that means and, and you know, how often that happens and how often that is um, happening even in public health is concerning. And um, what are we, what are we missing when we're doing that? Um, mm. what does that mean when we are purposefully or not, um, having that erasure? Mm -hmm. Are we, we are, you know, upholding those systems of, of oppression and to, to start to, um, train the next generation to move past that. And so, you know, thank yeah. you for, for elevating those issues. I think those are really important thoughts and calls for our next generation of public health professionals to think yeah. about. Yeah, um, that, so, that book mentioned caregivers and yeah. uh, care providers. I'm just like, there's so many people who have disabilities who are caregivers. Yes, <laughs> right. And for us to only, you know, to be, be completely left out of that conversation. All I could think of at the time was like, okay, I want to build with this person. I, I, we need to we need to have a, right. a, a, a collective conversation because there's too much. There. This is vitally important work, um, but people with disabilities cannot, should not, must not be left out of it. So yeah, ever yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. I know it's preposterous that someone with a disability is a caregiver, right? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Just under <laughs> undergirds all of the social uh, the, where we are societally on disability. Yeah, yeah, for sure, so, absolutely. Let's then talk about action, right? And and what are some actual actions that our rising public health professionals, even our seasoned public public health professionals today, <laughs> can take to do a better job on promoting racial and disability justice to really, mm. you know, move this needle now and not mm. wait until you know the right moment, I guess, or until mm -hmm. we've we've come to some other imaginary point in time what you say? <laughs> okay so this question always makes me smile and I get real hyped up you know like I'm, I'm getting ready to go out and dance or you know like really get I'm like I really get pumped and then I gotta I gotta slow myself down and I gotta tell myself I gotta ground myself a little bit so I want to actually I want to I want to offer these words so the first remember that interventions if we're talking about coming in and intervening in a situation I want to be really clear because a lot of times we get ready we get motivated we're revved up we, we want to move on something and I always I, I'm I am definitely one who does this. Um, but I want to think about like, as, as we're planning, as we're structuring interventions to remember that interventions are often used against uh, people with disabilities, right? So for example, as an excuse to assert authority, to institutionalize or to otherwise disenfranchise under the guise 
um, of rescuing or saving an individual, right? So I just always want to be very clear about how these things can go wrong. I want to ground us a little bit and, and, and give you a tool that's been very helpful for me because it has it has honestly helped me from not feeling so much of the pressure that I have to figure everything out, right? Um, really check out the book, Healing Justice Lineages by uh, Erica Woodland and Kara Page. It's phenomenal. I just finished that. But I'm going to reference another book because they, they, they talked and they, they, they taught about, um, about that and all of the creative solutions that come from community. Um, and and I, 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 I want to acknowledge that because I'm also right now going to evoke the words of Linda Two-Way Smith, um, who talks about uh, interventions in her book, Decolonizing Methodologies. And so uh, as a quick excerpt for access, which is, you know, by now what I do um, to make sure everybody has access. She says that um, indigenous scholars teach us that the community itself invites the intervening project in and sets out its parameters. The various departments and agencies involved in such a project are also expected to be willing to change themselves in some way to redirect policies, um, to redirect and, and design new programs or to train uh, staff differently. Intervening is thus directed at changing institutions that deal with, and I'm gonna insert here, people with disabilities, and not at changing, insert, people with disabilities <laughs> to fit the structures, right? And when we're talking about structures, again, I'm going back, I'm talking about um, housing structures, I'm talking about labor structures, food structures, climate and environmental structures, education structures, critical legal structures, medical and public health structures, et cetera, right? Uh, lastly, she says that the community assesses impact and success and recommendations for any further replication. I ground us there because sometimes we will come up with things and we will think that they are perfect and that they are awesome. But if we are working in a spirit and with a commitment to disability justice, that principle that I talked about earlier, that leadership by the most impacted, that has to be present. We don't go in and tell a community what it is that they need, right? What is the most pressing issues because we got some data and we think this is the thing that we're going to invest the money in, right? The communities will say, yes, that's a problem, but a higher priority for us right now is this. Can you help us with this, right? Um, so we go in with a, a mindset and a methodology built around uh, addressing those issues and being in tune with what communities actually want. I love this idea of... of waiting for an invitation or reaching out uh, for an additional, you know, seeing how you can be invited to other folks table um, or other folks gatherings or convenings, right? To see how you can be of service in that way. Um, that's incredibly important because uh, again, sometimes we require people and Bonnie and I were talking about this earlier. I mentioned this on a call and we're, we're collaborating on a, a number of different things, but I, I mentioned this before I said, you know, we have to request permission rather than requiring participation. And so what does that mean? Request permission to join in with what other people are already building. Request permission for you to add your additional ideas or additional concepts or to partner, right? Um, request permission to, to build on things that people have already done, right? So can we, can we utilize what's already been happening here, the programs you guys started? Can we build on that, add some extra funds or, or use the information from that so that we can learn more about successes and things that might be helpful, right? As, as opposed to requiring that people participate in your study, requiring that people participate in your events, requiring that people come to you, take additional time out of their schedule to do whatever it is that you've designed for them to do. I'm not saying that that's all, always or inherently the wrong path. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that the people will tell you. The people who you are focused on will show you. The question is whether or not you will uh, heed what they say. <laughs> I'll also give you a couple other examples. So if you're talking about, if you care a lot about transportation, then obviously we're looking at this in terms of pollution and diesel exhaust in different communities. I, I do work around human trafficking. And the one thing that I tell uh, uh, trafficking survivors, that's both sex trafficking and labor trafficking. When it comes to people with disabilities, if you are trying to help them devise an exit plan, how are we going to do that if there's no accessible transit? Right. You tell people to let's work on your exit plan, your exit strategy, and then there's no accessible transportation options. 
for them, right? Or um, the the trafficker is the person who has the the accessible van, or the trafficker is the person who goes to get their medications, or the trafficker is the person who is assisting them with getting back and forth to doctor's appointments, so on and so forth, right? Um, so all of that is is important. Um, if you care about internet access, obviously this is something that we want to think about, right? In terms of people with disabilities having access uh, to the rest of the world, creating additional connection um, and and really decreasing levels of, of isolation that can sometimes happen. So we've seen the internet be used quite literally to help people save lives, raise money um, in that way. So if there's ways you can contribute to those uh, efforts or even just use those efforts to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening in community. Really think that through as well. I also want to throw this out here as we're always encouraging people to think about home and community based services and, and, and uh, advocating for those things and having people live out in the community. Please, please, please do not forget that people also should have access to fun. People should have access to entertainment. My goodness, dare I say we got the right to be ratchet. That means we deserve the right to party <laughs> and go to concerts and have a good time, right? Like all of that absolutely matters. We deserve access to parks, national parks and rivers and waterfalls, right? We deserve the phrase that I use often is the frolic in the flowers, right? Like we deserve access to that as well. Um, a lot of folks will say like uh, public health initiatives may, you know, they be thinking about food deserts and food swamps. Um, and then also, you know, so a lot of efforts might be poured into kind of urban gardening and um, community gardens as well, right, or urban farming. And my question around that is how accessible are these places? There was a community garden a couple of blocks away from my, where I live. My partner was able to garden in there, but it was very inaccessible. Um, you could not use it comfortably with the wheelchair. There was no options for raised beds unless you were going to build them yourself, right? So there was not a lot of access points. Um, if people with various types of disabilities wanted to come in and utilize that space, right? So these are things that I'm, I'm, I'm just encouraging you to look in a multitude of, way, of, of directions. There's no shortage of, of areas to, to jump in on depending on what your, your areas of interest are, right? That's not for me to predefine for you. Right. Um, that's for you to tell me and you to, to, to connect with with said community on. Um, I certainly would never want to come in and prescribe like what is the, the solid golden pathway uh, for you to pursue, because that would be quite audacious of me. And we it would be very presumptuous and we would ultimately be wrong. Right. Um, so I encourage you to define that and refine that for yourself in practice, not in perfection, but in practice. Oh, I love it, Justice. I love. Yeah. So, so, so important. And I got to just say, you know, we, we had talked about this before the, the seminar started, that your sage advice uh, to, to me and my staff and, um, and collaborators to seek permission and not participation is one that we have just continued to think about and, and really just has stuck with us. And I just think it's such a powerful thing and encourage everyone to heed Justice's sage advice is a very powerful um, path in working with communities. I loved how you wove in um, a focus on methods and methodology, which is again, so much of the focus of the work in public health in many planes and spaces. And, and I think again, those spaces tend to think they have nothing really to do with community in lots of ways. And, you know, you've really called that, uh, called that out and um, echoing that, you know, this work cannot be done without the leadership of people with disabilities in, in public health and in research, there is such a void of that. And you know, no disability research should ever be done without disabled people, without disabled people of color and from other intersecting um, marginalized groups in you know, co-research co approaches and including researchers with disabilities and working with the community, it just cannot continue. And um, it's, a, it's a problem, you know? And I think that we see that, right? We see that in the way um, the work is done and, and the way the, the, the research is interpreted and the disconnect from the community and the harm it's done, quite frankly, as you're outlining. And it is, it's harm, right? It's, it's, it, is. Um, it, it yeah. truly is, it truly is. The one thing that I will say just for clarity purposes, folks, when we say um, request permission, 
don't, this is not just about requiring participation. To be clear, you know, obviously you, as Bonnie has just acknowledged, as I've acknowledged, you want people with disabilities, you know, we, we don't want to uh, dismiss or to diminish the act of participation. You want people to be involved in these efforts, but using it as a requisite, right, to say, well, if they can't come to this, if they can't show up exactly how we want folks to show up, then there's no space for engagement. That is um, the false presumption that is made, right? Like that, that is um, the thing that will constantly drag us further away from what our goals are. And that, that is the piece that we're trying to acknowledge here. So request participation or request um, permission rather, uh, do not require that people participate in a way that you have deemed the most suitable way for them to show up and support, whether it be your research or your public health event or whatever endeavor you're involved with. Yeah, so important. And so uh, before we, we pivot to the Q&A of the audience, I've got a, a last question for you. Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that I adore so much about you and, and your work is how you are, you connect everything to art and creativity and remind me to try and do the same. And I, I want to just really end with that. And mm -hmm. can you share with our audience your perspective really on that connection. You and I have talked a little bit about it and I just would love for you to share that with the world in this space on the connection between justice work and art and creativity. You've already talked a bit about that, but why do you think making this link is so important? <laughs> and um, you know, I wanna hear my, I want my public health professionals to, to really understand that from, from you. Mm, you know, Tony K. Bambara said that we gotta make revolution irresistible. Right, and art is an entryway to doing that. I asked um, a device whose name shall go unspoken because I don't want her butting in in our conversation, um, but I asked her for the definition. <laughs> I asked her for the definition of, of art because I, I, I knew you wanted to kind of come around to this so that we could make an offering to the audience. And she gave actually the definition that I like the most. I don't know where she got it, but she said that art is the quality production expression or realm um, according to aesthetic principles um, of what is beautiful and appealing um, or of more than ordinary significance. And I love that because Leah Latchmi, Peepsna, Sam Racine has their work it appeals to my aesthetic principles. I deeply value the qualities embedded within disabled bodies and minds. Like there's something artistic about that. When I write, um, there is a rhythm there. Like a rhythm is a requisite for the way that I write because I listen to so many things and what sounds good to my ears is important, right? It's kind of forced me to write in a way that um, is enjoyable, right? Um, a way that is fun, right? Like, oh, these, oh, this rhymes, like this is poetic, this is good, um, this sounds good, right? Or there's a flow to that, it's like a mic drop at the end, right? Um, I've like directed uh, videos all, like for personal things and, and also for my professional life. And the person who I love working with, I, I call her one of my many partners in creativity. And um, she, she tells me like, I, you working with you is so interesting because you always have every transition, all of the music to go behind the thing, all of the voiceovers, you know, you always have those things jotted down to a T, outlined to a T. And that is because it is, it is when I sit down and center myself, there's where, that's where my mind goes, right? I, and, and I envision so much actually in visual terms, um, which is interesting, but not as a, a in, in terms of internalized ableism or anything like that, but I do it as a point of access because visual mediums are not the most accessible for me, but they are for many of the people who I work with and who I serve and who I do work on in, in community with, right? And so it's important for me um, to consider that. Uh, when I train, I also consider each session as an opportunity to curate, an opportunity to amplify the work of other um, individuals, like a wide array of authors and activists and, and individuals. Like you've noticed just in this conversation alone today, I just dropped, I don't know how many <laughs> names of, of, of books and then quotes from different individuals and excerpts. Um, things that quite literally speak to my heart. And I, I go to those places because it's it's the areas that are, are least expected, right? Like some, I'll, I'll be reading a book about um, the Latinx diaspora and it may not even have any specific mention of disability, but my whole thing is you can't expect to, to, to grow with the community if you don't understand the soil from which they are rooted. 
I'm going to say that one more time. You cannot expect to grow with the community if you don't understand the soil from which they are rooted. Right. And that's for anybody and so or any community that you're working with. And so I try to start myself off there. But I also, you know, I think about it is the thing that kind of sustains me. It is my lifeline to be able to add in uh, gorgeous words from from like a poet like Ross Gay or Lucille Clifton, you know, to close off one of my sessions with the, with the words of Lucille Clifton or to start off the words with Toni Morrison. I, yeah, yeah. It is amazing. Right. It gets me pumped up. <laughs> but it's also because we deserve that. These issues are heavy enough. They are hard enough. They are harsh enough. So many of us are in a place of just perpetual grief. I actually wrote a piece that I'm going to put up on my website um, soon called Crisis Response. And crisis is spelled C-R-Y, capital S-I-S, crisis, because I'm thinking about all of the, the Black women I know, Black trans women, Black cisgender women, um, gender non-conforming folks, any Black femme folks who I just identify uh, with the work and um, how much it is needed to simply cry, right? And how we're not really given a lot of space to do that, right? This idea of strength, this ableist idea of strength, this is racist idea of needing to show up and be strong and support everybody else and to pull through and to be resilient until it rips you of every morsel of energy that you have left, how exhausting that is, how dehumanizing that is, right? And so I created that and I just said, I, this, this, is, this is what my soul is telling me right now. But that, that for me was a creative avenue. I work on crises and disaster work. You know, a lot of my uh, work focuses on that area as well, uh, disaster justice issues. And I say, oh, the crisis response. So I want you to have a crisis response. I want you to cry as needed. I want you to cry as a portal if you need to, to, to time travel or transport yourself to another place. I want you to cry to understand. I want you to cry to survive. I want you to, to cry even while preserving your privacy because our pain is not performative right um so I think about all of those things when I think about creativity and when I think about the things that give you life and I think about the things that sustain us um my partner is a gardener <laughs> and so she is creating this this whole garden situation in our backyard and the one thing that I've learned is that you can give a plant as much water and as much sunlight as you you so choose but if the container is too small it still won't grow and so we got to give ourselves and each other more space. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Justice. Yeah, I, you have been so important to, to me in my life and reminding me of, of some of these um, important <laughs> components of the work, right? And sustainability. And, you know, so many people don't understand how hard this work can be. And certainly, you know, I have, um, many planes of privilege. And when you don't understand the history of the community, when you don't understand the community and you're doing work in a space, it's, 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 you gotta, you gotta get in there and, and learn it because of what you just described. It's that hard history. It is that stealing of our joy and you encourage us to take it back. And you always remind us to take it back through being creative and that is so important for this work and in public health spaces for those from the communities doing the work you have always been such a constant reminder to make that space so we can continue because it is so darn hard and i just want to thank you so much for that um, we only have just a few minutes but i wanted to give our audience um, an opportunity to ask questions um, you can type it into the chat if there are any questions. Um, but while people are, are thinking and considering, and I'm turning on my chat to try and navigate it. Um, yeah, I just, I really do. I wanna give you immense thanks for all you've done for this world, for so many communities, for me personally, and, and keeping us moving forward and helping us um, to come back to joy because that that is at the core of what helps us going. And we got <laughs> It is. And I, if it's, if someone wouldn't mind create, creating some collective access, if folks can throw my contact details into the, into the chat, I don't think I, I, I don't 
um, I don't have it like posted anywhere, but um, if folks, if, I don't want to force people into such a small time window. So if there's questions that you may have for me, or you just want to take a minute to digest and come back later, you can always reach me on my website. That's simply my name, justiceshorter.com. Or you can, we can talk on Twitter, <laughs> maybe at justice shorter one, there's a lot going on on Twitter, but it's just justice shorter and the, the number one. Um, if you want to keep the conversation going or, or let me know of a comment that you might have, just in case. Yeah, thank you, Justice. That's a great idea. And I think with our remaining time, I'm going to, I just um, put, shared uh, your link in your handle with our admin team and um, yep, and they've just posted it to, to everyone attending. And I think that's actually a, um, a wonderful idea. And just again, thank you so much for your time Thanks. and for your knowledge and your work and your labor. Um, I appreciate with us today. I appreciate you so much. Um, Absolutely. Thank you. And thanks everyone for attending. Um, as a reminder, we'll be here same time, same place, um, different registration link um, with Yomi Rong. And we'll be talking about um, uh, racism and ableism in healthcare settings specifically. And it will be uh, another really great conversation. And I hope you'll, you'll join us again. Thanks everybody.